started, I'll go outside and say, hey, can we move a pizza? <laughs> All right, so anyway, um, I'm Susan Hardy. This is something that I'm passionate about. It's just showing off our fabulous students. And I think they sell our programs better than we can ever sell them. So what we have is, starting us off right now, is we've got them. We've got Jonathan Boardman, Kyle Byron, and which classifier is most robust to class imbalance? Yeah. How much? What did you win for your uh, prize for Art Day? Uh, we got five hundred bucks. So five hundred bucks. Although we have yet to, we have yet to receive it. Right? But, but, <laughs> but they get to put it on their. It said. It is said that it is coming. Anyway. Yeah. But, yeah, there's a prize. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, we got the cardboard check. Yeah, I got that. Okay. Yeah, I got that. So yeah, our project was which classifier is most robust to class imbalance? Uh, so to understand what we were doing, the first question is, what do we mean when we say class imbalance? Well, a data set is considered to be imbalanced if the target classes are not present in equal proportions. Uh, since classifiers in general are attempting to minimize some cost, uh, if errors in both classes are treated equally, then the classifier is going to have a tendency to develop a bias towards whatever the majority class is. So consider for a second, you've got a rare disease, right? Maybe it's only present in 1% of your data. Well, you induce a classifier with that, and the classifier says, nobody has the disease. Well, it was 99% accurate, but clearly that's a bad classifier. So this kind of data, the thing is, is actually typically really valuable. You want to catch the disease. You want to catch the credit card fraud. You want to catch the, the Samsung Galaxy before boy gets into the shop. So this is very, Topic. Uh, so what we worked with specifically was credit card fraud. Now, since in the interest of time, we're going to kind of blow through the data set portion, just suffice it to say that the data set we used, we got from Kaggle, and only 0.17% of the cases were actually fraud. So very highly imbalanced data. Uh, and if anyone's interested, we'll be more than happy to send you the PowerPoint and uh, any other information along with this. So how do you normally deal with imbalanced data? Well, Two approaches. One are the data level methods. These are going to be typically your sampling methods, something like oversampling your minority class, undersampling the majority class, uh, cleaning up your class boundaries with something like Tomek link removal, or even generating new synthetic minority class examples. Uh, the other level is algorithm level methods. This is adjusting your classifier threshold, adjusting your class weights, um, even modifying the algorithm to be more sensitive to whatever the rare class is you're interested in. But even before you do that, what classifier do you want to start with? So you, know, you want to pick the right tool for the job. So that's what we sought to answer. Which classifier is most robust to class and balance? We looked at four classifiers. These four are the ones that you're going to see in the Kaggle competitions, data science competitions. These are the ones that win. And one of the most popular that many of you are probably familiar with is the random forest, or at least you've probably heard of it. So the random forest is kind of a wisdom of the crowds approach. Uh, each tree in the random forest is going to be trained on a random subset of the data and trained on a random subset of predictors. And it's sort of going to overfit to that. So each tree is going to have a unique view on the problem. And so we're going to take each tree and we're going to aggregate all those viewpoints together and have like a majority vote and then the majority wins. So each tree then has a unique viewpoint on the problem. And then collectively, we actually get a better classifier. The next one we had was the bag neural net. This is basically the same thing as the random forest, except uh, artificial neural networks instead of decision trees. The next one is quite different. This is the gradient boost tree. Now, it's more like a game of 20 questions. It's going to take its first best guess. And think about this thick green line you see here. That's like the first guess it, it gets. Well, it doesn't quite fit, but it, it captures some of the trend. Well, then the residuals from that, we're going to use that to fit another tree. And then from those residuals, we'll fit another tree. So each time it's going through, it's iteratively building a model, and it's slowly converging on whatever that pattern is we're looking for. Now, as a side note, this is actually for a gradient-boosted regression tree. Um, this is for a continuous response, but the concept is basically the same. 
The last classifier we looked at was a support vector machine. Support vector machines try to find the hyperplane that's going to best divide the data set into two. And now the best hyperplane is going to be the one that maximizes the separation between the, target, uh, between the two classes in the, in the target class. And that's why we call it a, a maximum margin classifier. Interestingly, this is the only classifier that we looked at that was a non-ensemble method. In other words, all these other ones, we had a whole bunch of different classifiers trained, and they were all working together to make a collective vote. This was just one support vector machine. So keep that in mind when you see the results. But Kyle's going to talk a little bit about how we actually evaluated these. All right. So um, since we're interested in how these classifiers work on like varying classes of class imbalance, we decided to use this technique called SMOTE. It stands for Synthetic Minority Oversampling Technique. And here's sort of like an illustration of what it does. So it starts off by like isolating only the fraud cases and uses k-nearest neighbors to find the nearest fraud cases and artificially points a new fraud case in between those chosen cases. And if you do it enough, you can actually reach 50-50 um, like balance. So for SMOTE level one, we decided to go ahead and do 50-50. And as the SMOTE level increases, we start to approach the, the true and balanced nature of um, the data. So yeah, that's Moat, and that's how we created all the data sets that we used to, um, uh, to do the analysis. So next. So this is, um, we're gonna use the precision recall area under the curve in order to um, evaluate our, our classifiers. Precision tells us out of all the cases the classifiers determined as fraud, how many of them are truly fraud. And recall tells us out of all the truly fraud cases, how many of them uh, how many did the classifiers correctly identify? So our goal is to achieve a precision recall close to one that tells us it's a robust classifier um, when, it, when their data set's imbalanced. So we used um, K-fold cost validation to de develop confidence intervals on, on our um, metric. So at our 50-50 level, you can see that all the classifiers perform generally well. Then as the data sets start to become unbalanced, you can see the decline of performance. And the interesting thing that we saw with the neural network is that at seven and eight um, levels, the confidence interval is relatively large, which means it's very inconsistent at those um, low um, class imbalance areas. And uh, towards the original data set, this is the true data set, the true class imbalance. You can see that the, you know, the bad neural network is essentially guessing with near zero um, uh, precision recall area on the curve. So if I had to, ch to choose which classifier to use without any pre-processing technique uh, from the start, we can go ahead and start and say that maybe we can go ahead and use gradient boosted tree, random forest, or support vector machine. So that's what we found. And yeah, and then interestingly, if, if we could go back and do the scan, it would be really cool to look at an ensemble of the support vector machines. As I mentioned earlier, that was the only one that went solo. And it actually went head to head with these other um, ensemble methods. So anyway, very interesting results. There's a lot of work left to do. but. Uh, any questions? Yeah. Frank. <laughs> All right. So I decided to do uh, my project on um, factors that predict heroin use um, and as well as uh, demographics. So there's some demographic trends that I was interested in, uh, mostly changeable factors. So what are some factors that people can change that influence um, their propensity for heroin use. So uh, I got a data set from the University of Michigan, and this data set contained variables related to a person's academic choices in life, um, choices about um, friends, um, family structure, um, I guess interactions with adults, um, homework, uh, do these people do chores, do their parents give them job well done when they complete their chores on time, many different variables that I thought were interesting and variables that could be changed, perhaps some behavioral uh, issues that could be addressed. Uh, so that was the, the most important thing that I was looking for is what are those things that are changeable that influence heroin use? Um, now, as I did this project, uh, it was very difficult to, uh, to find all of those variables. Um, there were things that, there were a lot of missing levels for some of these variables. So as I did the project, I learned that uh, in order to build good models, the most uh, telling variables were actually demographic in nature. Uh, for example, income, uh, degree of religiosity, um, also has the person tried other drugs. So this project explores social and demographic factors relating to heroin use in the United States, and the data is very recent. Um, let me see here. OK, 
Okay, so I did some exploratory uh, data analysis. Um, I looked at the frequency of heroin use by gender, and one of the things that, uh, that stood out immediately is that there's a higher proportion of males that have admitted to trying heroin. So that was the first thing. You can see there's a, a, a much higher proportion. Um, it's not really shown by the scale, but males do use heroin in, higher, um, in a higher rate than females. And then I looked at the income levels. Um, almost everybody in the data set had reported, had some statistics about their income levels. And so we could see that in this um, demographic of more than $75,000, there's a higher proportion of people who are using heroin. Um, the red is those individuals who have, and the blue is those who have not. And then we also see uh, a little bit of a, I guess you could say a high proportion here, and those individuals that are on the low end of the twenty to $30,000 range. And then religiosity. So I just want to point out there are a lot of variables that were interesting to me, but due to the necessity of having um, you know, a sufficient uh, sample size, I had to uh, choose those variables that didn't diminish my, the, you know, the size of my data set. And this is one where most people were okay answering questions. So religiosity. Um, people who were more strident in their opinion uh, either by being very religious or very secular, tended to have a less proportion than, I guess this, these people here um, who are somewhat religious, uh, they marked uh, a large proportion of heroin usage. And it's kind of hard to see, but people who said that uh, religion is not important at all, they also had a, very, a fairly high proportion relative to uh, these individuals who were somewhat ambivalent or very, very religious. So I just thought that was interesting. And then um, the age breakdown was, this was something that was, that was kind of telling. Um, in the 22 to 23 range, we have more individuals reporting that they've tried heroin. But I, I did find this interesting um, that many of the respondents in the uh, 12 to 18 group just declined to respond. So the survey data uh, gave them the option of just not answering the question. They could say, I prefer not to respond. So um, this would make sense, though, that you would see as individuals get older, uh, there's a higher proportion of reported heroin use in their demographic. Because as you get older, uh, you have more choices to make, more, you know, hopefully you, you don't make that choice. But you would, you would expect a person to uh, experiment with this as they get older, and not so much that they're younger. And hopefully in school, um, you know, I, I just can't imagine, you know, young kids experimenting with you know, IVs on their free time. But you can see that as people get older, the proportions increase. So after doing the exploratory data analysis, I got an idea of what variables I should put in the model. Um, some were by necessity, others were purely about interest. And I built a logistic regression model, which is just, it's a model that uh, it takes variables and it uses those variables to predict either a yes or a no. Yes meaning this person has tried heroin, no meaning they've never tried heroin. Um, one of the ways of telling if this model is good is by using something called an ROC curve. And um, here's some details about the model. Um, it'll basically give you uh, some, uh, these are the intercepts of the model. So if a person has a, if this has a negative number, it says that this variable, um, it, it contributes in a negative way to the response, which is yes. Whereas we could see that MJ ever, which stands for Mary Jane, um, that has the highest coefficient. So this suggested that marijuana usage was a pretty good predictor about um, heroin usage. And so when I interpreted this model, um, I looked at the coefficients, but I also looked at the log odds ratios. So the coefficients themselves are not as intuitive as the log odds ratios, which will give you an idea of if someone says, well, this person is uh, 10 times more likely, or this person is three times more likely, that's what you use log odds ratios for. Um, so you take those coefficients and you um, raise them, or I guess you take the exponential base and then you, you raise them to those uh, coefficients as exponents. So this is the finding. People who are relatively extroverted, male, and who have used marijuana in the past are more likely to use heroin than people lacking these characteristics. And that was all implied by these coefficients right here. I, I could make those inferences just by looking at these numbers. Um, so some of the other things, um, the, 
the logistic model indicated that higher religious affiliation reduces incidence of heroin use by 15%, and fi uh, higher family income reduces uh, the risk by 13%. So just, just a couple of findings uh, from this model. Um, I just did a calculation on all the coefficients to get these, um, these odds ratios. Um, this would tell you that uh, a person who has used marijuana is 37 times more likely uh, to try heroin. Um, males are, uh, you know, 1.68 times more likely. Um, and then the ROC curve, it shows the trade-off between the true positive rate and the false positive rate. So an ROC curve, uh, you want an ROC curve to be um, close to one. So if the ROC curve looks like this, it means there's a 50-50 chance of getting it right. Um, but because the ROC curve, the area under the ROC curve is it's closer to one than it is to 50%, you can tell that, uh, that it's good at, at accurately predicting um, if people have used uh, heroin. It looks like I'm out of time, but I'm almost done. Okay, are there any questions? Yes. I'm sorry, there was one. Your age group, 35, 49, was the question, did you ever take heroin, or was it, did you take heroin between the age of 35 and 49? Ever. Have you ever tried it? So with more time, you had more opportunities. That's correct. So you would expect the proportion to increase with time because there's more opportunities to try something the older you get. So um, that is intuitive. Okay, so um, I use something called a confusion matrix. A confusion matrix is another way of telling how good is your model at predicting the, the response. And so uh, what you have to do is you take a, uh, your data set and you cut it into a training and validation set. So you build your model with 70% of the people and then you use that model to, uh, to grade the other 30%. And you have a way of verifying if they actually said yes or not. So your model will tell you, should they say yes? And then you can also look at what they actually said. And so the, the confusion matrix shows that this model did pretty well. But it could be because it was overtrained. In the future, I would like to um, have an equal number of yeses and noes, whereas the overwhelming preponderance of people said no, because either they're ashamed of it or they just don't want to answer the question or they really haven't tried it. Um, but the confusion matrix showed that uh, it was pretty accurate at um, deciding, at, at, you know, saying when people have, when they have. Yes. Different crimes. 
and if I can really see the crime trend over a period of time and can I really forecast how the crime would be going to be for next to three years and can I really predict how many crimes can happen on a particular day on a particular place using my historical data. So the whole analysis has been done using R. So this is the exploratory data analysis. So the first step uh, we have to do is like with the raw data. So you have so much information available. So you have to convert this raw data into useful information that you can easily able to visualize to the people who doesn't know any statistics. So this is the exploratory web analysis. So I'm interested. So which are the different crimes happened in Atlanta in 2016? You can see these are the different crimes in Atlanta. You can see like larceny is the highest crime happened in Atlanta in 2016. So larceny is like a taking someone's property illegally. So, so it's, it's kind of similar to that. And you can see that's the highest type and followed by burglary and auto theft. These are the most happened in 2016. And you can see like uh, generally the frequency of the crimes, they won't be consistent throughout the day, right? There may be certain time intervals where you observe more crime. So I converted the time into different intervals so that we can see like how the crime is happening throughout the day. We can see like the crime is happening, the crime is increasing when you're going to later off of the day than you, than the morning, because most people would be out by the time. And you can see the similar trend by month. You can see like the summer months have more crimes because more people would be out the time. And you can see like Friday and Saturday has more crimes because people would go around to the midtown. You can see more number of people roaming around the city. And so, so whatever the analysis that we have done so far is like related to all crime types. So if I want to really know when is burglary happening, when is auto theft is happening. So if you want to see, you can look at the heat map. You can see like the burglary is mostly happening in the early mornings from 6 to 12. The people might go from the work and somebody might come into their house and go on some burglary might happen. And auto theft is mostly happening in the late evening when people come from the work and they might park their car in the parking lots. And if you see the day of the week, you can see like the burglary mostly happening on the weekdays because people might be gone for the work. And auto theft is mostly happening on the weekends when people might have parked their car in, at the house because weekdays they will go for the work. And so this is just the 2016 data. I'm really interested to see whether the crime is really decreasing over a period of time. So I have taken the data from 2009 till 2016. I combined the whole data sets and started seeing if there is any trend. You can see like, uh, this is the, the first one is 2009. You can see that, you can see that the crime is low in the winter months. So as the summer is approaching, the crime is more and it's decreasing. So you can see similar pattern every month. The summer you can witness more number of crimes and as the winter is coming, they're dropping. So there is clearly there's a seasonality pattern, and but overall you can see from 2009 to 2030, 2016 the crime is decreasing. So there may be several predictive technologies available right now in police department, or they might be hiring data scientists like us to better analyze their data. So whatever may be the reason, but the crimes the crime is decreasing in Atlanta from 2009 to 2016. So I have taken the I have taken the data and tried to forecast if we can. Uh, how the crime would be for next to three years, it would be a similar pattern. The crime would go on a decrease for next to three years too. So in 2016 itself, we have this much technology. For the next three years, the technology might be better. And there might have several data scientists joining the data analytics field and we can better uh, analyze the data. So the crime would go on a decrease for next uh, couple, of, couple of years too. And this is the, um, the, the, the forecast for uh, broke down to day. You can see like, like right now, what we have observed is like the Friday and Saturday would have more crimes. The same you can see here. And over the trend from 2010 to 2020, it's going to decrease. And you can see like in the summer months, you can witness more crime compared to the winter months. So, so whatever we have seen so far is the temporal way of analyzing the data. Means you are analyzing the data of a particular region over a period of time. How the crime is going to happen next year like that. So analyzing the data over a particular region with respect to different neighbors, like the, since we, our data set has uh, spatial elements, like we have the latitude, longitude information, exactly when the crime has happened. So I have taken that latitude, longitude information, and I tried to plot it uh, that into the, I mean, this is called the shape file that they generally use, um, generally used to, to do any analysis. So I have taken the shape file, uh, from the Atlanta City Police and tried to plot the crime incidents in 2016. I just taken for one month because if you plot all 2016 data, you cannot really see. 
And even if you take one day, you cannot really see any crime incidents. Like if I just take it for first month. I try to plot how different crimes distributed spatially throughout that throughout that area. So you can see like uh, these uh, these beats have more crimes, right, compared to these beats. So so this is one way of analyzing the data, and this is like uh, the density maps. Um, this is more useful, especially when you have very limited number of police resource. So the main problem with the Atlanta city police right now is like they have very limited number of resources. So in order to be Atlanta city to be at least safe, so they need at least 2,000 police officers. But they have around 1,600 right now. So they have really, really that attrition problem is really in the department. So whatever they have limited number of resources, they have to right now, they have to use it very efficiently. So these are the crime hotspots. So you can see like I have taken the only for burglaries. So where, where the burglaries were happening actually. You can see these are the hot spots for burglaries. These are the main areas. So this burglary is distributed throughout the city. But if you see rape, this is happening only in this area. So if they really want to employ police officers to reduce this one, they can better use the resources. They can ask them, they can employ in these areas. So we can tell them if they have very limited resources, we can tell them these are the beats that have more number of crimes happening. So they can efficiently use the more number of police officers in those beats only, especially when they have very limited limited time or limited resources. So all these spatial and temporal way of analyzing data would be definitely uh, important for them. I mean, I think I have more time. No. <laughs> now, now it's time for questions. Okay. Any questions so far? I mean, that, that, that's just what I have told right now. So if you have very limited number of resources and if you want to really, the data is different, well, like spatially and temporal, so this type of analysis would be very good. And I have even gone through and tried to predict if I can really predict uh, any crime. I mean, can I really predict that these many crimes can happen in, this, in these days, like depend upon historical data that I have. So I try to build a model and see, and you can see like, uh, the most important for a prediction is like, uh, uh, Irrespect of the, uh, like uh, we have seen the season is more, more important right now, we have seen the day of the week is also important. Other than that, the most important variables, like if there is any crime happened in that particular beat on the previous days, like history. Like if the crime happened in this particular location over a week, the crime can have, may be more likely to happen in the next couple of days too, right? So I have taken those history and I try to create if there any uh, crime happened in the past seven days, like past 30 days. So those turn to be very useful predictors in predicting the model. Not in each month, I just have the overall level because I worked in Atlanta Police Department. So they use it looks like in summer people take vacations and Saturday. I mean, Sunday they have, yeah, what I have learned, like they have uh, the, the count of, they try to maintain a minimum count for each and every uh, day. So they give some police out for the country, they have tried to replace somebody else. So I don't think, I mean, as for my idea. <laughs> I'm presenting um, on planting seeds of change. And before I get started, I would just like to thank uh, Professor Hardy, Dr. Nee, and Dr. Ray for advising me, because I would not have been able to do this without their assistance and help, so thank you. <laughs> so I decided to, um, my, to have my project on reforestation. My grandfather is an agriculturalist, and my father also has interest in agriculture, and that kind of transferred down to me as well. So I was really excited to find this data set on trees. So um, reforestation is really important because, as you can see up there, it's very devastating when areas are wiped out by wildfires or um, really any devastating events you know, hurricanes, but in this instance, it would probably more likely be a wildfire because this is in Colorado. So my data set is from the Comanche Wilderness in the Roosevelt Forest. And this just gives you some information about my data set. So there are 253,365 plots of land that I'm looking at, and each plot of land is about, is a 30 by 30 meter plot. And 
Um, here's some of my variables. There are 11 variables, elevation, aspect, slope, distance to water, or uh, distance to roadways, hill shade at different times, and uh, distance to fire points, and soil. So soil is one of my qualitative variables, and it has 28 different types, or 28 different levels of the soil. And to figure out which type of tree will grow best, in a given plot of land, I use multinomial logistic progression. So this is some of my code that I use. This is like the highlight of it. Um, and I'm gonna go into more detail, but I use the library in that. And um, I set the base as Aspen and the soil base as soil type 10. So right here you can see that I have 11 input variables, so 10 of those are quantitative, and I've listed some of them before, such as the distance to water and uh, fire points, and then also we have an input, input variable soil, which is categorical, and the output variable is tree types. So there are six different types of trees um, that are in this data set. So right here you can see that um, I have the predicted probabilities for each land plot. So after running this code up here, it shows you that the highest predicted probability for a land plot one is the lodgepole pine. And then the highest predicted probability for a land plot two would be Krumholtz. So it's really inefficient to look at this um, chart every time you want to figure out which one is the highest predicted probability. So I just created a new variable that tells you which uh, tree it has the highest predicted probability to be in that land plot. Um, this is all run on the trainer model. So that is two thirds of the data. And that has an accuracy rate of 70%. And then um, after running it on the validation data set, on the one-third data, um, it has 69.6% .6 accuracy. And uh, this, so this does not, may not seem like that much, but if you compare that to the 17% chance if you're just randomly planting the trees. So this is gonna increase uh, the, increase the efficiency of reforestation and you'll save time and money and all of that. So, um, And here's the odds ratio table down here, and I'm going to interpret one of these for you. So the odds of lodgepole pine and soil type 19 relative to aspen is 52 times 52.1 eight five times that of lodgepole pine relative to aspen in soil type 10. Because remember aspen and 10 are the base. And here you can see uh, these are just some graphs. So the predominant tree type in this uh, data set is lodgepole pine right here and ponderosa pine and Douglas fir do better um, on low elevation. This is elevation by cover type. And up top, you can see this is the distance to roadways by tree type. And uh, ponderosa pine and Douglas fir do better closer to the roads. And um, down here, this is slope by cover type and lodgepole pine and aspen do better on lower degree, uh, smaller slopes, and uh, ponderous pine and Douglas fir do better on steeper slopes. So, but again, um, my model is actually going to take into account all of these different variables all at once, so that you, and give you a better idea and and it will predict which tree has the best probability with up to 69.6% .6 accuracy. 
And so, yep. Do you have any questions? <laughs> yes? Is your modeling for the best place for the tree to survive or the best place for the, does it account for, so say you have wildfires, and a lot of times it's like, when we go around and plant, mm -hmm. we increase the chance of wildfires the second time because of how we plant the trees. Is your model predicting which is the best place for them to grow, or is it accounting for that as well? It's predicting the best place for them to grow. Okay. So. Are there any other questions? Daniel. Yes. Oh, sorry. No mic. Is this likely to be used by um, Forest Service or something, or is it just an interesting exercise? Um, I would say it's probably more of an interesting exercise. They have already done something similar, so yes. And your findings kind of match what they've done? Yes. Yes. Uh, I found it on Kaggle originally, and then I also um, found it like there was a link to the website, and I've actually got to talk to the people who collected the data, so it was very interesting. Big round of applause. Thank you. Cool, like uh, Dr. Hardy said, my name is Jan. Uh, I'm currently doing the ABM program, so if you guys have any questions concerning that. Uh, it's the accelerated bachelor's to master's. And our um, analysis, we won our day for undergraduate, we won first place, right? And we got uh, we got $1,000, which we split three ways. So that's usually how the, 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 the uh, competitions work. Um, today we're going to talk about, our, our, our analysis was concerning opioid data um, and called it the opioid epidemic, a story told in data. And uh, like Robin, we used uh, NSDUH, you see a uh, national survey on drug use and, and mental health. And it's basically just a comprehensive data set that has about 60,000 observations, 57,146. And it has uh, about 2,000 questions that they ask each participant. And some of those questions are logically coded, which means it's if they've, let's say if they've asked you uh, if you've done heroin the last six months, they're not going to ask you if you've ever done heroin. Um, again, they're not going to ask you questions that they could answer using logic. Uh, they're not going to keep asking those questions over and over again. So the way that they use, the, the way that they collect this data is through uh, cold calling, which is not really a, a good way to statistically sample. Um, uh, you, you can randomize the digits of, of, of where you're calling, but that's not a very good way of, because you, you're missing out on the people who don't use cell phones, you're missing out on people who don't use landlines. And they, they don't really do anything in, in the way of uh, in-person surveys because it's, it's, it's prohibit, prohibitively expensive and you can't really get as many people out there as you can if you just call them. So that's one of the problems that we, we had with the data starting out, right? So you can't really have that. And then it only has participants uh, above age 12, which is fine, but a lot of psychology research suggests that a lot of these problems, they start you know, ages, like when a person is born, these, these kinds of problems, mental health problems, they start at a young age. So we also thought that might be a problem, um, having only data on, on people who are like 12 years or older. Okay, right. And then we also used to do a chi-squared uh, goodness of, um, okay. yeah, goodness of fit test, we had to use census data to see if this data set is actually representative of the population as a whole. Right, and then we had, um, statistical questions. Some of these questions are kind of like, you know, duh, but we still had to present them formally and, and kind of go through them. So is there a relationship between the age first used heroin and the age first used brain reliever? So we looked at the, the, those two differing uh, um, questions and see if if the age of someone doing heroin is 22, what, at what age did they start doing um, opiates? Okay, let me speed it up. Are, very, are the variables ever misused pain release and every ever used heroin related? We could look at that. We looked at that. Um, education and heroin use, and then we, the last one was uh, good, the chi square goodness of fit, where we looked at uh, whether or not this pop, this data set that we have was actually good on the population that we were testing, which is the U.S. population. You over to Matt. So when we wanted to uh, look at our variable, variables before we started uh, running our statistical tests, so we looked at uh, box plots for heroin age and 
the first stage of uh, using heroin and the first time misusing pain relievers and found that the medians were at about 20 and 18. And we also looked at the uh, bar plots for ever used heroin and ever used or ever misused pain relievers and found that obviously not a lot of people have done either of those things. So we, we used a few methods to test our questions, including a linear regression test. And uh, this test told us that there is a relationship between the two ages of first using heroin or misusing uh, pain relievers. Uh, we ran two chi-square tests of independence. One was for ever using heroin and uh, ever misusing pain relievers. Uh, the other one was for uh, looking at the education, educational attainment and ever using heroin. Um, we also ran a relative risk to learn more about uh, the relationship between ever using heroin and ever misusing pain relievers. And then we did the chi-square goodness of fit test to compare the two data sets, uh, specifically for the education categories. Uh, so for some of the results, uh, we found that there is a relationship between the ages. Um, there's also a relationship between ever using heroin and ever misusing pain relievers. Uh, so when we ran the relative risk, we found that somebody who has used heroin is uh, almost 12 times more likely to have misused pain relievers. So this is what, what we found the uh, chi-squared results for the education attainment and uh, ever using heroin and found that there is a relationship between the two. And so to look more into it, we looked at how each education level could was influencing the chi-squared value. And uh, it's easy to see in the visualization that college grads had the largest effect on the heroin uh, usage, meaning like what was expected, like if this was randomly distributed, that what was expected for college grads was not what, what, what would be expected for college grads if like everyone used heroin, that uh, it, wasn't rela it wasn't similar to what we found in the data set that it was actually, what you see over there is that it was a lot less than what would be expected. That's why that one has a negative influence and uh, high school grads had the largest positive influence, meaning that like a little bit, maybe a little more was observed for high school grads than what we would expect to have used heroin. Uh, and then our last test was the goodness of fit. And though they, so, one of the colors represents the data from the census data, and the other one is from uh, the survey. And though they looked at their about the similar, uh, they were st statistically uh, different. Um, that was the last test that we had ran. Uh, any questions? You got anything to add? Yeah, Robin. So. Uh, we use the same data set, and one of the problems that I encountered was uh, just losing uh, the dimension of the data set. As I subset um, on more variables, my 57,000 you know, observations shrunk down to maybe a few hundred. Yeah. Um, with all of the variables that you used, what was the final size of the data that you were able to... Well, for each analysis, it was different uh, because you were looking at completely different um, levels, right? So. I think, yes, but we were all, they were all above uh, 600 observations. Yeah, yeah, but also the biggest, it's, it kind of ties back to the first presentation, is we had huge class imbalance. There's, a hu there's just a huge class imbalance in between people who have done heroin and people who say they have not done heroin, right? So it's like it's hard to actually uh, run any analysis, because I was going to do support vector machine, but it... Because of the size of the data, it couldn't, you couldn't really run it on um, your, your, a computer like on R. It just wouldn't take it, right? Um, and so, yeah, we did run into that kind of problem. It's like you just had to whittle it down to a certain point. What's up? Uh, did you guys try to, did you weigh your variables when you started to shrink it down when you were comparing it to the census data? Or weigh it? So you have different different groups of population and yeah. since your observations were so like 600 you just said yeah. did you weigh it to kind of distribute it accordingly to like the different actual sizes of the group or did you uh, just attack it from <coughs> the 600 observations well once
once you have, once you're running analysis and you have enough, uh, you have enough of the, the population, then you can just extrapolate to the to the rest of the population. But this is also one of the problems we have with the data. This is you, you drop it down to 600, and how can you really say? How can you be statistic? How can it be statistically significant? Because what you would really, if you want to really look at heroin use and uh, opioid use, you would have to run an experiment to, to control for all the variables, right? So that's something that we wrote up in our uh, in our uh, conclusion is that you you can't really use um, survey data to look. You can survey data is kind of like a snapshot of the population, but you can't extract. Like it's not a very good way to extrapolate into the future or like how many other more people are going to be doing the drugs and stuff. So, does, it, does it answer your question? We didn't really... Kind of. Yeah. Well, from, from the census data, we actually, we actually got the proportions of like what... So it was only like a column of... Because when you do chi-squared, you only need like how, however many variables you're, you're, you're judging on, you only need that many uh, proportions to look at chi-squared. You don't need a whole data set. You just need to boil it down to a set number of proportions, and then you can compare those proportions with other proportions. And then if they're, if they're, if they're similar, then it's, it's statistically significant. If it's not, then it's not. Does that make sense? We, we had to combine... Yeah, yeah, we had to combine like some of the categories from the education on the census to match. Uh, what we had on the survey. Okay, we're on the time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.